official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official Okay, it's 2 o'clock all right, let's get, let's get started. We have a lot to cover today. Um, so again, administrative stuff, the, the midterm exam should be no surprise to anyone is this, this Wednesday, two days from now, in this room at the same time. Uh, I think everyone who, who, who needs accommodations is email me. If you haven't yet, please do that. And then the study guide is available online along with the, with the practice exam. Um, project two will be due after the fall break on Sunday, October 27th. But we'll be holding a recitation this Thursday at 8 p.m. on Zoom. We'll announce that on, on Piazza. Uh, and then that'll be recorded, and we'll make that available on Piazza afterwards as well. OK? Who here has started Project 2? OK. A little bit. OK. Again, I realize there's other exams. There's other uh, beyond this class. But you should really get started on Project 2 that way, because it's not going to be easy. And uh, you, know, you, you can show up the recitation and ask, ask harder questions, OK? All right, beyond this, again, we have some, uh, some Davis talks coming up. Today at 4.30 on Zoom, we have Parade DB. They basically took Postgres, stuck Data Fusion inside of it first, got rid of that. Now they put DuckDB inside of Postgres. Uh, and then they have this thing called Tantivy, which is a sort of like Lucene when we talked about full text search indexes. They put all that inside of Postgres. So that guy's giving a talk today. Um, and then the, when we come back from fall break, there's a, another startup called Sp Spice.ai. Uh, and they have put data fusion, uh, they're using data fusion to do LLM stuff, I think. Uh, and so at the, the beginning of a talk. And then I'm assuming you, you pronounce this as Exxon. Uh, they're giving a talk uh, about their tool using data fusion at the end of this month. If I had to vote for one database startup to get sued for uh, trademark infringement, it'd be these, these guys, right? Uh, I, don't think, I don't know if, if Exxon Mobil is as litigious as Disney, but. You're asking for it, all right? So, all right, that's not our problem, though. That's his problem. OK, uh, any questions about the midterm? Any questions about project two? All right, so let's jump into this. I mean, I say this every class, like, uh, oh, this is going to be a great lecture. But this is going to be a great lecture, because it joins. It's super, super important. Um, so last class, again, we started talking about how we were going to implement algorithms inside of our database system to start running queries, right? to start processing data, to do essentially the relational operators that we, that we we want to support uh, to, to you know, produce results for when people send, send us queries. And one of the key things that we talked about, which is getting the theme of this semester, is how to support data sets, either intermediate results or the base tables themselves as we're scanning them, that are larger than the available memory that's, that, that, that we have in our database system. And one of the techniques that we, we used last class, and we'll see this over and over again throughout the entire semester, uh, is this, approach, this, or this pattern called divide and conquer. Like breaking up a hard problem to smaller problems, meaning breaking up something that, that doesn't fit in memory uh, into smaller chunks that do fit in memory, and then divide that up and then slowly merge it back together to produce the final result. Right, and we'll see the same strategy used today when we start to talk about doing hash joins. If the, ha you know, if the data set doesn't fit in memory, how do we handle that? And then the other key thing that we discussed last class is that we started off talking about external merge sort. Uh, or sorting in a database system, and we showed how we can use sorting to compute aggregations, but then we also started talking about how to use hashing to, to compute aggregations as well. So we're going to see the exact same thing today. We're going to see different approaches to do joins. One will be, you know, one will be based on basic for loops, one will be based on sorting, another will be based, based on, on hashing. Right? And these are basically the two main choices you have whenever designing a you know, data-intensive algorithm. Am I going to do something through sorting? Am I going to do something through hashing? And we'll, as we go along, we'll see the pros and cons of each of, each of these. But in general, the spoiler for this lecture is going to be hash joins are almost always going to be the better choice, the faster choice. But we'll, we'll, see, we'll, we'll, under, we'll go through this and understand why. All right, so it should be sort of obvious at this point in the class, certainly if you did homework one, why do we need to join? Well, in the context of our relational database system, there's this technique called normalization, which we didn't discuss because I'm trying to how does this? I don't think you need to know about normalization other than to know that it exists. Uh, a, a prior version of this course you used to teach normal forms. It's basically how do you take a table and split it up to, to smaller components, like through foreign keys. 
right? Think of like the, the first normal form is like I put everything in one giant table and then I can split it up and break, and break it up to, you know, the, to cross reference tables, dimension tables that we talked about before. Right? That's called normalization and there's a whole theory uh, uh, background on it that you don't need to know because nobody uses that in the real world. So I'm saving you from that. But since we know our, 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 our database can be broken up into smaller relations, smaller tables, we obviously want to join it back together. Oh, go get Andy's account and get all his orders. Well, that's a join between the order, uh, order table and the account table, right, over some, over some key. So this join operator is going to be the mechanism, is going to be the way that we can reconstruct the sort of full tuple, or his original tuple, or for the, the full entity that we're trying to expose in our application. The join is how we're going to be able to stick these things back together. And we want to do this in such a way that we don't have information loss. Meaning, if I join, I want to join Andy's account with Andy's orders, I don't want to miss some of Andy's orders, right? I want to have the exact answer. So that, that's the goal for today. The type of algorithm we're going to focus on, uh, in particular, is going to be called an inner echo join. So an inner join just means I have two tables, and I'm doing uh, an exact match on them. And the, the echo join means I'm the, the join predicate is just going to be a quality. Right? You can do less than, greater than. There's things called anti-joins where something is not in something. Right? The, at a high level, some of those algorithms will be the same. Um, but for, for simplicity, we just focus on inner echo joins. And I'll, I'll talk briefly how we can extend that to, to left, like left outer join. Most joins in the real world are going to be inner echo joins. Right? Most of the time, like when, you, when you write queries and applications, it's going to be inner joins, uh, inner echo joins. Left outer joins are probably the second most popular one. Um, and anti-joins and, and semi-joins, these are like special case things we'll, we'll cover later. So the other thing to understand is that we're going to focus in this class on binary joins, meaning we're only going to join two tables at a time. Now, the query may reference multiple tables, maybe, you know, three or more, but the algorithm we're, going to t algorithm we're going to talk about can only take two tables and then join them together. And if you want to join another table, then you take the output of the first join and you run the same join algorithm or, or the, the same binary join algorithm on... On, on, you know, on the output with another table. There are techniques called multi-way joins. Uh, these have existed in the literature for a long time because it seems kind of obvious. I want to join three tables. Why not join them all at the same time? Uh, but in practice, nobody implements them because uh, the performance can be, can be variable. Like Microsoft added this in SQL Server, I think in like 90, 19, 1998. They took it out in 2001 because depending on the queries, depending on, on the workload, the performance could be all, all over the map. So again, most systems that you can think about uh, that you know of are going to be doing binary joins that we'll talk about today. There's another more modern category of join algorithms called worst case optimal join algorithms. This is, these are used when you're doing like graph traversals, like think of like a, a network uh, 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 representing a graph structure like a, uh, like a social network. Um, these are rare. Uh, there's only a few systems that I know about, Umbra, CedarDB out of Germany, for, uh, and then uh, that relation AI people that came talked about before, they have a worst case optimal join algorithm. Uh, these are special case algorithms. I suspect they're going to become more common in the future. Uh, and we do teach these in the advanced class. Uh, but for this class, we, we don't need to know that. Another big thing that, we're gonna t that we'll sort of lightly touch on today, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this after the, semester, uh, the, the, the fall break, um, is deciding what, in what order we should join and actually what joint algorithm we should use. And this is what the query optimizer is going to do for us, and we'll cover that again after, after the fall break. But the idea is that I, I say in my SQL statement, I want to join these two tables. I'm not saying what I want, join, you know, join A versus B or B with A. And I'm not saying what joint algorithm I should use, sort merge join versus hash join or whatever. So all that's going to be abstracted away. The cost model and the optimizer will take care of that for us. But in general, as we see as we talk about these algorithms, the rule of thumb is going to be we want the... The, the left table, what we'll call the outer table, and I'll explain what that is in a second, that, that should always be the, uh, the smaller one. And we're going to do this for performance reasons. And again, when we show the algorithms, you'll see this. So we saw this last class. Again, what, what is a query plan? Uh, it's always usually represented as a tree. Uh, it's usually, usually uh, implemented as a tree. Some systems can do it as a DAG. Uh, tree is obviously a special case of a DAG. You want to use a DAG if you can, but most systems don't. Again, the idea is that the data is going to flow from the bottom to the top, going from one operator to the next, right? And then the output of the query is going to be whatever the, the, whatever the root node spits out for this, right? So in this example here, we, see we have the join on RNS, 
right? We're getting uh, data from R up into this, and then S through, goes through a filter first, and then it goes into the join. We join that. Again, this is a logical representation of the plan. I'm not specifying what, the, what this join algorithm actually is. I'm just saying there, there is a join. And actually, at this level, too, you're, you're not even specifying what is, what is the inner table versus the outer table. We'll see that in a second. So there's two decisions we've got to make. One is, what should be the output of our, our join operator? And we talked about that before, like late materialization, early materialization. We'll, 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 I'll show examples of this in more, more detail. And then the next thing we've got to worry about is, how are we going to determine whether one join algorithm is better than another? Well, I just said that, oh, you typically want the smaller table to be the outer table, like on the left side of the tree, which usually has represented. Uh, but the, how do I know if I'm joining three tables, which ta two tables should I join first, and then the third? Right? So we need a cost model. We need a way to understand which one is going to be better for us. So in case of the first decision, it's that, again, late materialization versus early materialization. So no matter what joint algorithm we pick, like what physical implementation of the joint operator we pick, the output is always going to be the same. Meaning joining R and S in this example here, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing a hash join versus a, a start merge join, the, the logical output is the same. Meaning the, the tuples, the unordered tuples will be the same. Now there may be physical properties that I'll care about later that will be different. Like start merge join will come up, the data will come out sorted, right? Because you have to sort it to, in, order to, in order to do the join, whereas hash will be more random. For that, we, we, can, we, can, ignore about for, we can ignore for now. Uh, but there's other design decisions we'll, we'll, we'll cover after the midterm as well. Is like, are we sending out one tuple at a time every time we invoke the join algorithm? Or is it a batch of tuples or all the tuples? Uh, where, if we have to spill a disk, where does that go? Right? So the output we could be log will logically be the same, but physically it might be different depending on what algorithm we're using. But again, for, for this class today, we don't have to worry about this. So this is just a rehashing what we talked about before, the, the difference between early materialization and late materialization. Remember, early materialization, the idea is that I'm going to construct the entire contents of the tuple at the moment I retrieve it from whatever the source of data that I'm getting it from, like a table or a file or some, some network storage. right? So if I take this query here, I'm joining R with, with S, right? I'm going to produce the, the logical output, which should look like this. right? Here's R and all its attributes. Here's S and all its attributes. right? And then now, when I compute this join in the query, Right? This whole thing is going to get from, you know, from this operator, it computes this, and then that gets fed up into the operator above it, which is a projection, which is going to throw away the stuff that it doesn't need. Right? And in this example here, because I got the entire contents of the tuple at the bottom, do the join, and then that join basically mashing the two things together, and that's going up the query plan, the, the upper operators in, in the query plan never have to go back and get more data. Right, things are just pass along from one operator to the next. So in late materialization, the idea is that at the moment you retrieve the data from the underlying uh, you know, data source, you get the bare minimum you need at that moment for that given operator. So you can be a bit clever here and say, OK, well, I know I'm going to have to do a join later on. So I don't need to bring in these other attributes, like name and then value and, and date. I'm just going to bring in the ID. And then I store the record ID that corresponds to where this tuple came from. And then that's what gets passed up from this join operator here. Right? So again, if I think I have 1,000 columns, or even something larger than that, then I'm, only, I'm not passing around those 1,000 columns for the two tables as I go up. I'm just passing, again, the, the bare minimum. So then when I get to this projection operator here, it then has to say, OK, well, I know I have these two tuples coming into me, and I, I need to go get the, the date field from the S table. So I'm going to use the S table's record ID to then go fetch whatever the pages are that has that, that, that date. And then, and then fill it in. Yes? So like for projections, why don't we propagate what fields we want and just get them? Yeah, so the, question, the question is, why don't you propagate what fields you want at the bottom, yeah. and then when you do the join, pass them along. That's called projection pushdown. Yes, we'll get to that later. Yes. But that, that is a classic. That, that's, a, that's the optimization you would do for this. Yes. But again, it actually depends on like, yeah. So, so what he's proposing is that going back here, right? I know I'm going to need the customer date. So at the moment I do the join, instead of just throwing away the customer date, go stick it in as part of the tuple, right? And then do the join and pass it up. So again, depending on how your, your query plan is implemented, do I have the tree here, right? This could be over the network, right? And then 
you have to do the scan and then you do the filter on another machine. So maybe I don't want to pass over the network, the customer date, because it's, it's, it's going to get filtered later on. So maybe I want to do a, another retrieval here before I do the join, but then I might as well just do it afterwards. Like there's, there's all the different dynasty you can make. Uh, we're not there yet, but it's not as trivial as like, oh, I know I'm going to need this. Let me pass it along. Because again, I may pa be passing a billion tuples and then filter down to just a two and I'm passing along customer date and it was a waste. Like this stuff is like like figuring what you the bearing you need to do the minimum amount of work is like super hard because to be honest your statistics are going to always be wrong so you're making guesses on bad data which is hard or obviously prone to error. Okay, so this is common in column storage because uh, if your columns are you know the different attributes are stored in separate files, why go fetch those files just to stitch things together? Only go get them as you need it. All right, and then the other presentation we talked about is how we actually determine whether one algorithm is better than another. All right, and so say again, we're going to use this query as our running example throughout the entire lecture, You're joining R and S uh, on a simple ID lookup. R ID equals S ID. I'm not saying whether R, I think I, we say actually S, R ID is, is the primary key, and I forget whether, I don't think S ID is, but in the, for our discussion today, it doesn't matter. But the, the variables going to use to understand the cost of doing these joins are going to be this M, N, and R, uh, big M and little m. Big M and little n. So we're going to take this M and then it'll be M, little lowercase, tuples in R. Pages in, in S, little n, pages in, in S. So that for this class and this lecture, actually for the rest of the semester, the cost metric we're going to use to determine whether one join operator is better than another is just going to be the number of IOs we have to use to compute the join. Right? So we're going, to, we're going to ignore what's the cost of actually me writing out the result if we have to spill a disk, right? Because to be honest, that's going to be the same for all our join algorithms. Because as I said, the logical output is going to be the same. They're always going to produce the, the, the same X number of tuples as their output. So it doesn't matter what you're doing one algorithm versus another. I've got to spill out the disk if I have so many tuples and run a, run a memory. We're also going to ignore the computation and network costs for now. Uh, obviously, doing the nested loop join, we'll see in a second, is the easiest thing to do. And it has a low CPU cost because you're just just doing a loop, for a bunch of for loops. Um, whereas a hash join, you got to hash something and find a location. And depending you know what hashing scheme you're using, you got to scan through. Right, that's gonna be way more computation expensive. But we're just gonna assume that the cost of going to disk is so much more than any compute computation we have to do. Especially our hash table is gonna be very very well optimized. We, we we can ignore that. The network cost will also avoid as well because again. At this point in semester, we're still assuming our database system is running on a single box. We'll talk about distributed queries later on, but like you could do a join across multiple machines, and now you got to figure out where the data is, where do you got to move it to, and that certainly is going to be expensive. But again, for today, we're going to ignore that. So it really comes down to how much I.O. do I have to do? And then to simplify also our discussion, we're going to assume that nothing is already in memory. Because again, you can't account for that in your calculations, because like, depending on what other queries are running at the same time, how much memory you have, and, and so much other factors, you can't, you know, that's a moving target, it's hard to calculate. So for, for our purposes here, we'll just assume that everything's on disk, and what's the cost of bringing things in, and then we have to spill the disk writing back out. Okay? All right, so here's the menu we're gonna to discuss today. So we're gonna to first talk about the nested loop join, which is the most, the most simplest thing you can do. Then we'll see how we can do sorting to do sort merge join, but then we'll spend most of our time at the end talking about different variations of doing hash joins. Because right, again, these will be the most important, uh, most important thing to do. If your system is trying to support uh, transactional workloads or OTP workloads, as we talked about before, you typically implement index nested loop join, the one at the top. Because it's like, again, going and get Andy's account record, that's going to be one tuple, and Andy's orders, maybe 10 tuples, and you'll have an index for those. That's going to be super fast. Hash join is going to be too slow for this. But if you're doing analytics, the OLAP, uh, workloads, like deriving new information from the data you already have, you're going you're gonna to want all of these. And then the high-end systems will, will support all of them. Uh, Postgres can do all, all three types of joins, hash joins, or sort merge joins, and nested loop joins. I think MySQL added hash joins about five years ago. For a while, they couldn't do that. I don't, I don't think they can do sort merge joins. I mean, certainly like Snowflake, uh, uh, Databricks, and, and Redshift and all those big, the, the big OLAP cloud systems, they can do all these things. I think DuckDB can do all three as well. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Let's, the most simplest thing to do naive nested loop join, we'll see why it's stupid, and then we'll, we'll build from there. 
So again, this is the query we're going to target, joining R and S. So the naive nested loop join is just two for loops, hence the name nested loop. And all you're really doing is just looping through all the tuples in, in table R, and then for every single one of the tuples in table R, loop through all the tuples in table S. If they match on our join key, like RID equals SID, then we're going to emit them as at our output. And I have this emit function to say, like, this thing has been this qualifies the join predicate, and it goes off, and, you know, goes off to the next round, the next operator. I'm not saying what, what that physically looks like just yet. We'll cover that later. So I've been referring to this language between inner table and outer table. Now you understand where this comes from. It's like when you use this term in terms of joins, right? It has to do with the loops, right? The outer for loop is called the outer table, and the inner loop is, is called, obviously, the inner table. And in most systems, they would represent, in the, in the query plan, the, this is to your left, the, the, the table on the left of the join operator is considered the, the outer table, and the, the one on the right is considered the inner table. Some systems flip this. I think Snowflake flips this. Uh, and then I think uh, SQL Server puts it on the side, makes it horizontal. But in general, you say it's the outer table. Typically, people understand that to mean the, the, right, the one on the left. OK, so i got to put this marker up. Don't do this. This is stupid. Why? You've got to look through the second table a lot of times. He says you've got to look through the second table a lot of times. And furthermore, we're not even taking into account that we're not storing data as, as single records. They're going inside of pages. Right? So this is basically saying for every single tuple, no matter in the outer table, no matter what page it's in, loop through all the tuples in the inner table, and then go get the next tuple in the uh, in the outer table, and just you know, fetch that page again, potentially, and do the loop all over again. Right? So again, it's obvious. For every tuple in R, we're going to scan S once. Right? And so the cost for this, going back to the, the, the nomenclature, the syntax we were using before, the cost is m plus m times n. The plus m is because we've got to scan all the pages in the outer table once. Uh, and then we're going to scan all the, the, the pages, the big n pages in the inner table little m times. So for every single tuple in the outer table, we're going to scan all the pages in the inner table. Again, assuming there's no caching, nothing's in a buffer pool, right? This is uh, it's, it's a very naive implementation. So if we turn these, 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 these variables into numbers, we actually can see why this sucks. And then as we get better, how much, how much faster we can make things. So say the table R and M, right? R has 1,000 pages with 100,000 tuples. S has 500 pages with 40,000 tuples, like not, not that big at all, right? And then if you, if you plug and chug these numbers in uh, to, to take, you know, take the formula, we see that we're going to do 50 million IOs just to do, do this join for these two tables. And let's say we have an SSD that can run you know, in, in, in 0.1 milliseconds per, per fetch, right? It's going to take 1.3 hours to compute this. Again, we're ignoring, you know, OS could be caching things, hardware could be caching. Ignoring all of that, just assume it takes for every disk I.O. 0.1 milliseconds, this simple join takes an hour. All right, well, what if I do the thing I said before, that you always want to have the smaller table be the outer table? So what if I flip that, R and S, make S be the outer table? Now we cut it down by 10 million, 10 million I.O.s, but we're still in 1.1 hours. Right? This table is super small, right? I'm showing abstract numbers, but assuming we're doing four kilobyte pages, right? It, this thing's six megabytes. That's going to live in L3 cache on your CPU. That's nothing. Again, hardware's going to be a bunch of caching, and like, it's not going to be as this, this bad, but like, if you just do the stupid thing and, and say, I got a single tuple at a time, it's going to be terrible. Yes? The question is, why, why do we add big M? Yeah. This question is, why do we add big M? So going back here, right? So I, my, my algorithm is, for every tuple in, in the outer table, so that's, that's an R, go fetch every single page once. Then for every single page, then I'm going to go fetch all, all the S's pages every single time. All right, so this sucks. But again, we know that the database is going to represent or store data in, in blocks or pages. So we can take advantage of that and do what's called a block, nest, block nested loop join. And the idea here is now we have much more for loops where they have the outer loop, uh, the top loop is getting every single block in R, the inner loop is going to get a, 
a block in S, and then now you just do the, the in-memory uh, in for loops on those, on those two blocks for every single tuple inside of them and check to see if I have a match. All right? So now the algorithm's better because now we still have the big, big M as the cost in the beginning because I got to scan every single block in, in, uh, in the outer table. But now I only scan the, the inner table big M times because for every single page in the outer table, I get all the pages in, in the inner table. In this example, again, we are assuming that we have one frame for the, the outer table, one frame for the inner table. We obviously have a lot more uh, memory available to us. So we, we can do better here. Yes? So it's, it's question, what, sorry? It's block and page the same thing. The question is, the same thing, yes. I think I said before, like, like block and page are roughly, the data system might call it a page on the internals, but in, in Harvard might call it a block. They're basically synonymous. Yep. All right, so again, for all these algorithms, we're going to want the smaller table to be the, on the outer, outer table, because that means we can try to keep that in memory as much as possible. Right? Um, and the way we're going to calculate this is based on the number of pages that we, ex we expect to have, or sorry, the number of pages we do have for our tables, and not the number of tuples that we would have for them. Remember, again, the database is going to maintain a bunch of metadata in the disk manager about, or the page directory, about for a given table, here's all the pages that I have for it. Some of those pages might have free, empty slots. Well, that still doesn't matter when I'm doing my join because I, I may go get a fetch to go fetch a page, and it may be you know, completely empty except for one tuple. I still had to go fetch that page. So it doesn't matter you know, how many tuples I actually have. It's, it comes down to the number of pages I have. That's what really matters at this point here. And as I said, we can be clever and say, OK, well, I know I have a bunch of buffer, buffer pool frames I can use for this. So I can use b minus 2 pages for the, the outer table. Because again, I want to try to get the outer table as much as memory as possible. Okay, to read that in once, and then I have to go, have to go back and read it again. And then I would use one page for the, the inner table. Because I, I, I can only do one examination of a page at a time. We're ignoring parallelism here. And then I need one page for the buffer for the output. Right? So you just change the setup like this. Right? I'm getting b minus 2 pages for, for the outer table, one page at a time for the inner table, and then do the scan. And as I said, block and page are the same thing. So again, we go back to our, our, our situation or, or hypothetical example before. Now the cost model is going to be big M plus the ceiling of M divided by, M, M divided by b minus 2, because it's the, the maximum number of, of pages I can get in b minus 2 blocks or buffers, and then multiply that by big N. Because that's, again, for all those, those, those pages, uh, the, so the batch pages I can get for the outer table, I have to go fetch all the, the inner, inner table's pages. So now, our query they had before, right? now we can get it down from, I think we had 40 million IOs for the, the, the blocked nested loop join. Or sorry, 40 million IOs for the naive nested loop join, switching uh, the, the outer and inner table. Now I get it down to 1,500. OK, well, this is actually more realistic now, right? And I, I can keep this join in uh, 150 milliseconds. That's reasonable. Not great, but reasonable. So if we sort of ch change the parameters of what B actually is, uh, you know, say I have 102 pages, right? Now, now this, this calculation has, has come into play. Now we get it down to the 6,000 IOs, or switch the outer, the outer and the inner table, and get down to 5,500. So what am I essentially doing here? I'm basically doing a bunch of sequential scans on the, uh, on the or try to sequential scan the outer table once, and then for each set of, uh, sort of batch of pages I can bring the outer table in, I'm going to do another sequential scan on the, on the inner table. Sometimes that might be the best you can do, and that, that, that'd be good enough it can, if, if the data set is small. But usually, usually again, usually you, you do, do not want to do this algorithm. All right, so this basically repeating what I just said, right? The reason why it's bad is, again, you're just doing a bunch of loops over and over again and blindly searching almost like a needle in a haystack to try to find a matching tuple between the inner and the outer table. But, again, the problem we have is, again, the sequential scans, but if we have an index that already exists on the table, then we can use that 
on the inner for the inner table, and then now we just do a scan on the on the outer table, a sequential scan, and just probe into that index to find the the, the match that we want. And then now we have, we don't have to do those, those sequential scans over and over again on the inner loops. So if you have an existing index, you can do this. Some systems will actually build the index on the fly. So SQL Server does this. They call it spooling indexes. So it says, I really would wish you had a B plus tree here to compute my join. So you know what? I'm just going to build it right now. So sequential scan the, 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 the inner table once, build the index, probe it for, for do my join, and then throw it away once the query is over. SQL Server, I think it can even come back and give you hints and say, hey, look, I keep, add, keep building this index to do this join. You probably should build it for me or tell me to build it. Yes? His question is, when would you actually want to build an index on the fly and throw it away? Well, we'll see this in a second. This is what hash join does, right? Uh, but the, as I said, if, if the, the data system can recognize, oh, I'm, I'm, the best thing for me to do right now is, is a index and a loop join. Because you can, you can calculate things like, hypothetically, if I had an index, this thing would cost this amount to build. And you can compare that against a hash join, a certain merge join, and you say, OK, the, even though I still have to, I have to build this index, it's going to be cheaper for me to do this than doing the, the naive nested loop scans, or even the block nested loop scans. Right? So, you, so the data set will have a, some notion about uh, how much data you have, what the query wants to do, and it can make that decision for you. We'll cover that after the, the midterm. It's hard. All right, so index nested loop join basically replaces the inner loop now with a probe to this, some index. I'm just calling this index. I'm not declaring what it, whether it's a hash table or a B plus tree or a try. It doesn't matter. We have a way to do a, a point query lookup to go retrieve a, you know, a single tuple, or sorry, for a single key, go get the one or more tuples that match for it. And then for each of those that match, uh, maybe do, do additional qualification, then you would go ahead and admit it. Right? So it's, you may be the case that you're, you're in this example here, it's joining R, R ID with S ID. So we have an index on S ID. So it's an exact lookup to go fetch that one tuple, or the, 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 the one or more tuples. But it may be the case my join clause also has additional predicates, and the index doesn't, doesn't have any information about the, those other attributes in my join clause. So I still do the probe and the index, get, the, tup, get the, the, uh, the record ID, go then fetch the tuple, then do the rest of the, the join evaluation, and if then it matches, then produce it as my output. So now our cost is going to be m, big M plus little m times c. And c is just some constant that says it's the cost of probing the index. Right? If it's a b plus tree, it's going to be a log n. Uh, if it's going to be a hash table, you know, uh, on average, O1. Right? But we can't account for that because we don't know what the index actually is in, in sort of theoretically, theoretical analytical ev evaluation right now. Right? So again, big M could be the scan all the outer table. Uh, but then for every single tuple in the, in the outer table, go do that probe. All right, so what are the main takeaways for a nested loop join? It's a building block we can use to, to, to start doing more complex joins. Um, in general, we're always going to want to put the outer table, to uh, the, have the smaller table of the two we're joining be the outer table. And we try to put as much of the outer table in memory as possible to reduce repeatedly ha having to scan it. Okay? All right, so in the, ex when the index nested loop join, we have a data structure available to us to go find the exact matches that we wanted, right? And that's part of the problem with the, the nested loop join. Without that index, you're just, it, it's just sequential scans. So with sort merge joining, the idea is that if I sort my data from my two tables that I'm joining on, on, the, on, the, on the join key, then I can walk through and scan those, those sort of results. And I know in some cases I never have to backtrack because as I'm going down, scanning down, I know that there isn't going to be some key on the inner table down below that's going to match, uh, you know, match on the other side, and I, you know, I, may, I may have missed it. Right? So the idea is that we, we sort everything ahead of time, and then that simplifies our scan to then allow, allow us to not have to, to hunt and peck and try to find the thing that we're looking for to do the join. So this is what I was saying in last class. There's the external merge sort algorithm we talked about last class, and you can use that in the external sort merge join algorithm. So you would use external merge sort 
in the sort phase of the, mer the sort merge join algorithm. It doesn't have to be external merge sort, it could be quick sort or whatever your favorite sort is, right? But you sort in the beginning and then you do the merge. So I'm not going to walk through the, this algorithm. Uh, I, don't, I don't really like to show code. But the basic idea is that we're going to sort them both first, and then there's going to be this cursor that's going to walk through the, the outer table and the inner table and sort of in lockstep. And they move down once they know that there isn't going to be a match anymore because the values are, are increasing or decreasing accordingly. And in the case of the outer table, we may have, or sorry, the inner table, we may have to backtrack because we missed something because the outer table moved down and repeated the value. But I'll show an example of that in a second. So again, here's our same query when, when we want to join R and, R and S. So the join predicate is r.id R equals sid. So we're going to sort both relations on the id column, right? So that's easy. That's done. And then now in the second phase, we're gonna, when we do the probe, uh, or sorry, the, the merge, we, we have this cursor that starts at the beginning of both, both relations. And then we're just going to compare across to see, is the value from the outer table that my cursor is pointing at, is that the same as the value that the inner table's cursor is pointing at? And if yes, we know we have a match. If not, then we, 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 move, we, move, down, uh, we, we move down based on uh, what the values actually are. So in the very beginning, I say also too, we, we, we're going to maintain some metadata on the, on, the, on the inner table for this last value to say within the sort of last, um, sort of last batch or range of values that I looked at, what was that value? In case I see that value again on the outer table, then I need to backtrack. There's some additional metadata to say, what's the offset to jump back into uh, up, up that? But for simplicity, we just assume that we're, we, we, are, we are keeping track. I'm just not showing it here. So in the very beginning, the, the, the cursor on the outer table is pointing at ID equals 100. The cursor on the inner table is pointing ID 100. These are equivalent. They're equal. So I'll go ahead and mash the two tuples together, and then that's in the output of, of my join. And then now the inner table's cursor is going to move, move ahead by one. We leave the outer, outer table's cursor alone. The inner table moves ahead by one. And now I do the same check. ID equals 100. ID equals 100. That's a match. So I, I produce an output tuple uh, accordingly. Same thing now. The cursor moves ahead on the inner table. Now I'm at 200. Right? And at this point here, 100 doesn't equal 200. And 200 is greater than 100. So I know I need to iterate and move the outer table's cursor down by 1. Because I don't know what's going to come after this 100. Uh, and I don't know what, uh, and I know what whatever it is, it has to be less than or equal to 200 if I could ever have a match on the inner table. So I go ahead and move the, move the, move the outer table cursor down. Now we get 200. That's a match. Going to produce our output. And now we move the inner, inner cursor down by 1. We get, two, two, uh, we get 400. Now at this point here, now the value has changed on the, on the inner table. So we go from, we were, at, we were at 100 because that was the batch up above, or the, the value up above. Now we go to this next one here. Now we set it to 200 because that's the last value that we saw before it changed. Right? And then now, because 400 is greater than 200, uh, I want to, we don't have a match, so that there, there isn't a join in here, a join tuple. Now we iterate the outer tuple cursor down by 1. But now we see 200 again. And at this point here, we recognize, oh, the last value I saw before I changed on the inner table was 200. So I want to backtrack uh, to where I was before, the starting point for when I, the last time I saw 200, because now there's a, there's a bunch of tuples that I didn't join with, with, with the, the outer table's tuple. So then now do the same thing, 200 equals 200. That produces an output. right? So that's fine. The inner table, oh, sorry, the inner table's cursor moves down by 1. Now we're at 400. Do the same thing again. The outer table's cursor is going to move down by 1, right? because I've already moved down over here. Now we get to 300. 300 is still less than 400, so I'm going to keep iterating this thing going down. Because right? again, I know that I saw 200 above. I'm at 400. Uh, there, isn't going to, there isn't a 300 on this side, so there's no reason to backtrack. And this thing needs to keep moving forward until it, until it hits 400, or greater than or equal to 400, because I don't want to move the inner cursor down before the outer cursor moves all the way down. Yeah. All right, so now we're at 400. 400 equals 400, produce an output. Inner table moves down to 500. Again, we set our last value to 400 in case we ever see 400 on this side again. Right? 400 is less than 500, so this is going to move down by 1. 500 equals 500, produce our output tuple. This thing moves down. Now we're at the end, and 
we can just short circuit this. Well, actually, no, take it back. You need to keep scanning down on uh, at least one more time here, because you don't, you don't know yet whether this is going to be 500, and therefore you need to backtrack. So again, once I see 600, uh, you, can, you can just stop. You're done. Yes? Are, are these uh, IDs stored, like, when they're stored in pages, are they stored? So it means that we fetch, like, a page, and we might fetch, like, all the way from like, 100 to, like, 5 or, like, 400? Your question is, going back here, uh, that these are sorted. Like, are these physically sorted on the, uh, like, Yes. Page? Yes, the question is, are these physically sorted on the pages? Yes. Right, because this could be like, again, I, I scan the table, I, I scan table R, scan table S, then you do an external merge sort. External merge sort is going to write it out to a bunch of temp files uh, in the order that they're, that they're sorted. Yeah, I'm not showing page boundaries in this, but you can imagine, like, if I need to backtrack, I need to go back multiple pages. And so that's, I, that's why I didn't want to show the offset to say because it, it's not just like, oh, just jump to the third offset this. It's really jump to the... the, the the offset that corresponds, or jump to the page that corresponds to the offset going so many, so many values back. Yes? If we already had like a, a cluster user to index on maybe our ID, would we still want to sort again? The so question is, if I already had a, if, if the, the data is already sorted, do I sort again? If it's sorted on join ID, no, it's already sorted. Yeah, but like the unclustered would not then show that all the pages are sequential, right? This question, the unclustered, yeah, unclustered, an unclustered index will not guarantee that the, the data is sorted based on that index, yes. Yeah. So your question is what, sorry, if you have a clustered index? Is that, like, yeah, it's sorted, but the, page, the locality is not there in unclustered, right? Like, this ensures that it's, lo like, actually, uh, the pages are, like, it's going to be okay. sorted inside the pages also. Oh, your question, uh, like, oh, I see what you're saying, like, the, if you have a clustered index, it could be within the slotted page, it's still not sorted. But they, that's not an issue because you would go over the slot, right? So physically, it might be stored in different ways, but the slot will be sorted by the value. So the iterator is really going over the, the, the cursors are going over the slot offsets. And that, that'll still be logically sorted correctly, even though physically the bits may not be. Okay. So what's the cost of this thing? Well, the sorting, the store cost for R and S, that's just what we talked about last class. Right? That's again, assuming doing external merge sort. And then the merge cost, assuming you're not doing backtracking, it's just read all the pages of M, read all the pages of N once, and I'm done. And I don't, again, it's not a multipl multiplicative for every single page on the outer table. I've got to go read every single page on the inner table, as we saw in the and loop join. I, I only have to go fetch the outer and the inner tables once. Right, best case scenario is like every, everything is all, uh, all the keys are unique and they're, and they're all sorted and I don't have to backtrack, right? So if we go back to our example again, right? Now with, uh, with, with say 100 buffers to do our, our sorting, um, the cost of sorting R is 4,000, the cost of sorting S is 2,000, adding them two together and then scanning them all at once, the total cost is 7,500 7, IOs. Much better than the, 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 the naive nested loop join. Not as good as the index nested loop join. Because the index nested loop join just does the probe on the, on the index and it's super fast. And we weren't, we weren't including that, the probe cost in our calculation anyway. So again, we went from, what, 1.1 hours down to still uh, you know, 7,500 milliseconds. That's pretty good. So the worst case scenario for sort merge join is if there's only one value uh, in, you know, uh, there's only one value in, 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 in each column. Like all the IDs are one, right? Because I'm going to end up sorting it and not, not producing anything different. And then I'm just going fetching and doing backtrack over and over again. Right? But in practice, sometimes it is very useful, especially if the query has an order by clause that just happens to be the same thing as, as your join clause. Because now, again, I till, kill two birds with one stone, I, I sort it to do my join, and then the output of the data is, of, of, the, of the join is sorted, and then now I don't have to run my additional order by clause. Or in the other way, if the data is already sorted on disk, as he was asking about, then great, then I, I, don't, I skip the first phase, I skip the sort phase, and just do the join directly on those. All right? Doesn't always happen. Uh, 
right? But if, if, if you can take advantage of that, uh, then it's a huge win, right? And going back to the cost here, right? The, the bulk of the cost here is from doing the sort phase, right? That's, that's 6,000 IOs. So if I can skip this and just do this, then I'm basically at the index nest loop join. All right? OK. So the, the next algorithm, the last algorithm to talk about is doing hash join. And the basic idea here is that we can exploit the fact that when, similar to how when we were doing inserting to a hash table, and then we do lookups on it. Well, if, 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 if things have the same, the keys have the same values, then when I hash them, they're going to end up at the same location. So the idea applies now when I want to do a join. If I build my hash table on one table, and then now I do lookups on, on keys from, in my join clause into that table, if the values are the same, then I'm going to find a match. And then again, that, that's equivalent of doing a lookup on the B plus stream. But what's going to be different here is that we're going to build the hash table on what we'll call the outer table. And then probe it with the inner table, whereas like the next loop join, you would probe the index on, on, on the inner table. But, but a high level conceptually, they're, they're doing the same thing. So a simple join house, a simple hash join algorithm have two phases. In the build say, the build side, the build phase, you scan through the, the outer table, you're gonna hash it some hash function to build a hash table. You can use whatever your favorite hash table implementation you want, right? Cuckoo hashing, linear probe hashing, uh, chain hashing. Lena probe is usually going to be the fastest one because it's so simple. You build that hash table based on, on that join key. And then now in the second phase, you scan through the, the, the inner table and just probe that hash table to, to find a match. And if you do, then you produce that as the output. So conceptually, it just looks like this. Again, it's two for loops, but now they're not nested because I'm going to loop for every, for every tuple on the outer table, build my hash table, loop for every single tuple on the inner table, and, uh, and then you probe the hash table and produce any outputs. All right. So again, first phase, I scan through R, just hash it, fill out this hash table that's going to sit. It's just sitting in memory. All right. It's not backed by, backed by the buffer pool because we don't want that because it's random I/O. So we want this to be in memory. And then now I'm going to scan through S, do the same thing, do a probe, and find any matches that we want. Pretty simple, right? So one optimization we can do is something we actually talked about before. I think when we talked about chain hash, we talked about how you can put a, you put a bloom filter in the, in the bucket array. So before I scan along the, the chain, which ends up being a sequential scan, I check the bloom filter to see whether my key could even exist in the chain. And then if it doesn't, I know I don't keep going. If it does, then I do, do, I do check the, the chain. So I can essentially do the same thing now for my join. So as I'm building the, the hash table, on the build side, the first phase for, for the outer table, uh, I can also build a bloom filter. And then now on the, the probe side, in the second phase, as, S, as I'm scanning through S, I first probe the, the, the filter, see whether I have that match. If I don't, then I just ignore that, you know, drop that tuple. If I do, then I do go check the, the hash table. Right? And the idea here is that the cost of going up, doing a probe in the, 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 the Bloom filter is, is way less expensive, or costs way less than the cost of doing a probe in the hash table. And so if my join predicate or my, my join keys are, uh, are unlikely to match, then this is going to be a huge win for us. Like if, if I know that I, like I don't really have, for, for the adder table, for the join ID, there isn't a lot of matching tuples in, in the inner table, then if I can throw th as much as I can away, with the, the balloon filter in the beginning without touching the hash table, then that's going to be super fast. Because the balloon filter is usually going to sit in, in CPU cache. Yes? So is this um, hashing only better if like, the original key is long and we are trying to use it, like we are trying to trade off from the, with the computation of hash to like the actual, com uh, actually comparing long composite keys? Uh, so your question is, uh, when you say hashing, hashing for, into the balloon filter or hashing into the? Hashing Hash table. The question is, is, is hash table only pre is hash table hash join pre preferable uh, when the join key is very long, yeah. and therefore I don't have to do like a like a, a bitwise comparison of things. Yeah. You still have to do that bitwise you, you know, bit by bit comparison, bit by bit comparison, even if you match on the hash, right? So your point, yes, if I hash and the, the, I don't find a match, like if the hash table is mostly empty, then yeah, that's gonna be fast. But if I have to start scanning down and because it's linear probing and start comparing keys, 
I still have to do that full key comparison. I can't just check hashes because I could have collisions. Like two different keys could hash the same thing. So I always have to compare the full thing. Yeah, so we are basically trying to use, like the trade-off here is we compute hash for everything to like eliminate uh, keys that doesn't have a hash collision because if the hash does not match, of course the key does not No, so statement is uh, that, so, so your question is like, I, are, are we doing a hash join because we can eliminate things when, we, when the hashes don't have matches? Yeah. All right, so the question is, why do you have to pay the, the cost to do a hash? Let's go, let's go back here. Ignore the Bloom filter, OK? So back here. Your question is, why should I pay the cost on the probe side to hash the key, then do a look on the hash table and find, find that my match versus just comparing the keys? How do I find the keys, though? How do I find the keys on, on, the build, on this side? Right? I have key, key ID equals 1, 2, 3, 4, right? I have one, two, three, four over here. One, two, three, four over there. How do, how does how does how does how do I find it for that key over here? How do I find it in this? This is unsorted, so I have to do a sequential scan. That's your nested loop join. That sucks. So this is basically an index for us that we're building on the fly, so I can jump to some offset or some location in my hash table that may not have exactly the tuple that I want to do my match, but it puts me in, in ideally in, in the proximity of it. So then, when I start looking around to try to find it, I'm looking for less things. Yes. So just to clarify, the biggest difference between this and the index version is that there we already have something built, and here we're doing it just temporarily. This question is, is the difference between uh, what we're describing here versus uh, what I said before, the index nested loop join, is it because this thing we're building on the fly, where the index nested loop join, you're building uh, uh, you're using an existing index. Um, at a high level, yes, but we'll see how we can, we can take this further and handle spilling the disk. Uh, whereas, like in the index and nested loop join, they don't, they can't, they can't do that very well. There's other optimization we'll see in a second. But like the ha ha hash table for joins, if it's if it's in a quality predicate, is almost always going to be preferable to an index or a B plus tree. Right. Again, it's there's no free lunch. Right. We have to we have to find matches. We either switch or scan, or we build a data structure to do it for us, or use an existing one. So here's how I'm showing you how to do this with the hash table now. Okay, again, so this technique is you're putting a blimp filter in front of it. Sometimes some systems are called the sideway information passing, right? Because the idea is that I'm passing information on this side of the join to my my sibling that's joining with me on the other side. And you think of the like relational model with these these tree data structures. Conceptually, you're not really supposed to route data from this guy up to the join and back down to the other, right? But, is it, but it's, it's an obvious technique you can do, uh, and it doesn't violate the relational model of relational algebra. Okay. So in the simple hash join I showed you, the hash table fits in memory. That's easy, right? Because it's not, it's, not, it's not random I.O. We're, not, we're never going to disk. We're just probing this hash table in, in memory, and things are fine. Um, but if it doesn't fit in memory, then we don't want our buffer pool manager to start swapping things out to disk uh, because since the, the hashing function sort of randomizes the, the locality of data, or the keys that we're trying to join on, I'm probing to different locations to my hash table uh, and at any time it could just be thrashing, moving things back and forth, right? So we need a better approach, again, to avoid this random I.O. and try to maximize the amount of sequential I.O. we can do and still do a hash join. Still use the hash table to, to speed things up, All right? So we're going to rely on that same technique we saw at the end of the last lecture, where we broke up uh, when we were doing the aggregations. We broke up our table into into buckets, have those spilled to disk as needed. But then when we do now the sort of the second phase of the algorithm, we bring those buckets in one at a time so that they fit in memory. And now since we we sort of hashed and partitioned things at the first the first phase. We know that the data that we need to join on has to be within the same sort of set of buckets at our level and not some ra other random location. So this is an old technique uh, called, called partition hash join. You'll sometimes see this referred to as the grace hash join. Um, and then the, the, you know, this is a classic technique from the 80s. Pretty much every system implements this of how to do hash joins when things don't fit into memory. Again, the two phases are partitioning things up, breaking up the buckets that, that, that that can spill to memory, spill to disk, and then we bring those buckets in incrementally and just do the joins based on those. 
the reason, called, the reason why it's called Grace Hash Joint is because it was, uh, it was invented by this group out of, out of Japan who built this thing called a database machine called Grace. And in one of the, the like, seminal papers out of this group was th they talked about doing the Grace Hash Joint. Uh, so back in the 80s, there was this big movement called for database machines. Think of like, you know, computing was so slow that uh, everybody was trying to build these sort of specialized accelerators for databases, and they called them database machines. Um, Grace wasn't the first one. There's a lot of, there was a lot of different versions of this. So one of the first ones here, this is uh, from IDM. I, li I like this photo because it shows this guy in like a suit working on a, on a database, which is obviously how we work now. Uh, but they would sell you special hardware that do sorting in memory because sorting was so expensive. So the, you, know, you, you buy this, this appliance database system, uh, and it had the specialized hardware to do this, you know, this one aspect of queries that was super expensive. Because again, when you think about the, the number of different operators of things you can support in a data system, it's not, you don't need a, a general purpose CPU, right? Because you're not going to be Bitcoin mining in your database system or doing some other random stuff, right? It's going to be a, you know, a, a reasonably sized selection of, of relational algebra operators. So you can start specializing some of those the more expensive things uh, and get a, get a huge win. So in the 80s, again, people have been, since the 80s and 70s, people have been trying to do this. And even now today, there's a bunch of different companies that will sell you different appliances. Right? Teradata will sell you something. Uh, Exadata is probably the most famous one. Uh, well, Oracle will sell you these, these giant box units uh, that, again, have like InfiniBand and specialized hardware to, to do things. Uh, IBM had this thing called Netiza, which was basically an FPGA that did projections, or sorry, did, did scans or filtering directly on the hardware and would feed it through the FPGA. There's another company also now in, in Yellow Brick. Uh, it's from a few years ago. They'll sell an appliance that's basically their data warehouse running in a, in a system. Uh, but Teradata and Exadata are probably the most, the most widely used ones. Like, these things are expensive. Like, each of these boxes is like $5 million, right? And that's like, and then you have to pay whatever, multi-million multi -million dollar a year uh, support contract for them, right? The reason why this stuff usually doesn't pan out, this stuff in the, definitely in the 80s, is because by the time it took you from like to, to design whatever the specialized hardware, to, to, to then fab it and then put it out for your customers. Intel or Motorola put out a new CPU and like because of Moore's, you know, Moore's law and all the benefits you got eventually uh, you know, got, got evaporated. But again, people are still trying to, so this is like the holy grail in databases, like specialized hardware to make databases go faster. There's GPU databases, there's uh, people use FPGAs a lot too, still today. Um, but yeah, like something better than, than just an x86 CPU would be a huge win for databases. Okay, so. Let's see how we do the partition hash join. So just like before, when we talked about aggregations, we're going to break up R and S into K buckets. And so there's just scanning through sequentially on, on the outer table, hashing it, and writing it out into, a, into the buckets. But this is going to be, you can start to think of this as, as, a, as like a, like a chain hash table. We're just, we're just putting things into uh, to, 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 so a list of values. Then I'll do the same thing on, on the other side. Uh, scan it and fill in and, uh, for, for the inner table. And then now when I do the second phase, I just go read the corresponding levels of the buckets from the outer table and the inner table and th then do my join. And I could build another hash table in memory, right? Like, like when we saw the simple hash table and, you know, on, on the outer and the inner and do the join that way. Or I could just honestly do a block nested loop join because everything's always going to be in memory and it's going to be really fast. Then now, once I'm done the first level, I go to the next level, and I know there isn't going to be a tuple, uh, say, on this side here, on the inner table, that's going to match to something on the outer table in, in this other level, because I've already hashed it and made sure that it lands in, in the right bucket level. And I scan through down, and then I'm done. Right? So what's one problem we could have? Well, what if now, as I'm hashing uh, in the sort of first round, and my uh, and I've skewed, my data skewed, and a lot of the keys are ending up in the same bucket, and now the, that bucket doesn't fit in memory. Right? Like the whole thing didn't fit in memory in the first place, but now when I partition again, the bucket, that bucket doesn't fit in memory. Well, I just do this again. Do, do another round recursively. I take the bucket that didn't fit in memory, hash it again using a different seed, make more buckets, and do the join once, once everything spills the disk again. The degenerate case, the worst case scenario is there's like one join key that has a gajillion values, and no matter if I hash it again, it's still going to end up in, uh, you know, it's all going to end up in the same bucket level anyway. Uh, so if you recognize this happens, you just fall back to a block nested loop join, 
and, and just do the join just for that, that one, one subset of keys that, don't, that uh, has to spell a disk, right? And then, yes, the block and nest, nest loop join sucks compared to, compared, to a, uh, you know, compared to a hash join, but by avoiding random I.O., right, you know, yes, it's, it's going to be slightly slower, but it's still, it's going to be almost always sequential I.O. at this point here. And this is general, okay, this is like the extreme case of like, I have one person that has, say the, you have an account on orders, there's one person that has a million orders or a billion orders for, for, for whatever reason, and it doesn't fit in memory. All right, so let's see how to recursive partitioning. So again, same thing. The first phase, I hash all, all, everything on the outer table using the same hash function with the, the first seed. But let's say this, this key here, whatever key is landing in, in, this, in this bucket here, level one, and that's get, getting completely full. So then now in the second phase, I just pass through the other buckets that didn't get full, like zero and k minus one. They just get passed over to the next round. You don't have to copy anything. You just say it just gets moved over. But then I use a different seed for the hash function again, and I go do a second pass over this data, hash it up, split it up to, to smaller buckets like that. And then now things have evenly spread out. Now things can fit in memory. So then now on the probe side, you have some additional metadata you've got to keep track of. If I hash a key and it lands in either the first or the last bucket, I know that wasn't recursively partitioned, so I know I can just jump to the right, you know, the right bucket offset, and that has the data that I want. But if I hash a value now that goes into the bucket that I recursively partitioned, then I know I need to do another round of, of hashing to go find the exact location that has the data that I want. All right? So what's the cost of a uh, uh, doing hash join? Well, if I don't need to do recursive partitioning, then it's going to be 3 times n plus n. Right, because in the partition phase, I got to read all of the uh, both the outer table and the inner table once, write it out once, hence the the two n plus n. But then now uh, in, in the second phase, I can read read them all back in every page once, and it's n plus n. Yes. So when we hash the inner table, how do we know which blocks have to go through recursive hashing and which do not? This question is if I hash. If I hash the inner table, how do I know, in this, case, in this case here, how do I know that if I hashed a bucket one, I, I should go for recursive partitioning? So you just pass the metadata over to say, you say, I, here's, the, here's the buckets in the first round of the hashing that it got split, and therefore you do another round. Like, I can recursively partition this infinitely. You wouldn't want to do that. In practice, one, is usually, one, one additional round would be, would be enough. Um, but it's, just, it's, it's easy metadata. All right, so again, going back to our example four, uh, the cost analysis is going to be three times n plus n. So I got to read a, um, do 100 IOs for the outer table, 50 IOs for the inner table, sorry, 1,000 IOs for the inner outer table, 500 for the inner table, add them two together, multiply that by three, uh, and you get 0 0.45 seconds. So better than, than sort merge join. Sort merge join was, what, 7,500 7, IOs. Again, obviously, there are generative cases where this, this won't work, but the, the, merge short, or the merge short algorithm, sort merge join algorithm would have the same problems if one key has all the values, all the matches. So there's one additional optimization we can do, uh, called a, what's called a hybrid hash join. And so this is, idea has been floating around for a while. As far as I know, nobody actually implements this because it's really hard to get this correct uh, because you have to know something about the data ahead of time that you may not be able to know. And the idea here is that if you recognize that there's some key that's going to be super hot, meaning I'm going to have to, on the, on the, on the, the, the inner table, it's going to do a bunch of probes and hit this key over and over again. Then rather than just spilling it to disk in the first phase, spill, like spilling all the buckets to, the, to disk in the first phase, I'll just keep one bucket or one, 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 a small subset of the levels that I know are hot, keep those in memory, let everything else spill to disk, and then now I don't have to worry about reading that back in over and over again, right? Or writing it out the in the first case. So say for whatever reason, there's some key, they're all hashing to this first bucket here. So I'll, what I'll say then is, okay, well this level here, this is gonna reside in memory, and I don't go through that second phase, I just do the join as, as, as it happens, as I'm doing the probe, 
And then everything else, that'll spill to disk, and I'll do the second phase of bringing it back into memory one, one bucket level at a time, and then do the join on that. Again, the reason why this is hard is because you, you, you kind of want to know what's going to be the hot key ahead of time, but you may not have any metadata for that. All right, most data systems will keep track of the heavy hitters, like what's the most common key. Uh, but that's just, you know, that's just, just, just within one table. But maybe the hottest key in this, uh, in this table may not be the hot key you're going to join on in this table. So you basically have to take statistics from two different things and try to, try to combine them together, which is not easy to do because you have an incomplete view of the two tables. All right, so hash tables can be of any, oh, sorry, the inner table can be any of size. Uh, but ideally, if, if I get my outer table to fit entirely in memory, that's fantastic because then, then I don't have to spill things to disk. Um, if I know the exact size of the outer table ahead of time, then we can use a, a static size hash table uh, that is sort of almost perfectly, uh, how does it, it's exactly the size that you need, things hash to an exact location, and then there's less overhead to do the uh, join. But in typical, typically, you don't have this. And so what will happen is like you're, in, like, in most data systems, you say, for when I run a query, I'm a, I allow the query to allocate this amount of, much of memory for my hash tables, and I hope I get that right. And then if I get wrong, and I have to resize it, and then I have to do the thing where you lock the whole thing and double the size and, and load it back up. But that's going to be super slow, and we, we, we want to avoid that. All right, so here's the summary of all the joint algorithms that we talked about here today, uh, and roughly what their I.O. costs. And again, the, in general, the hash join for really large data sets is almost always going to be preferable. Uh, even though it seems kind of crazy, like I, I'm building this data structure on the fly and then immediately throwing it away after I run the query. Well, yes, but that's going to be better than, uh, than doing a bunch of random IOs or doing, doing sequential IOs over and over again. I pay the sequential IO cost to build the hash table once, and then if, I'm, if I need to spill the disk, I, I can handle that. But then now I don't have to do a bunch of random IOs to, to do the joins. Because I sort of reduce the locality of where data could actually exist. OK? Yes? Why is index nested loop join variable? Because you don't know the value. The question is, why is index nested loop join variable? Because you don't know what the value of the C is. It could be a B plus tree. It could be a try. Right? It could be a hash table. Right, so if you said if it's log, if it's a B plus tree, you could you could put a log n there. Well, it's also a variable too because it's, it's um, like if if I have a, a one to many join, meaning like for one key on the outer table, I have multiple keys that'll match it on the inner table, then I might probe my index and then scan along a bunch of, a bunch of leaf nodes to get all the matches for that. So you don't know what that's going to be. At least at this point, when we're, when we're talking about this, because it depends on the data, it depends on the, the, the schema, it depends on the query. So even though it's still an equality predicate, it's like for one key, give me multiple, uh, one key in the outer table, give me multiple keys on the, on the inner table. So it's variable. Whereas, like in a block nest loop join, you basically scan the whole thing. I mean, you can be clever in some cases, like if you know, if you know it's one to one, uh, which is not always the case, then like when I'm doing my block nest loop join, if I if I say, I know there has to be exactly one and only one match on the inner table, as soon as I find it, then I can break out of the, the inner loop, right? But you'd have to know that. Yes? How accurate do these numbers actually end up being after you take into account like, CPU cost? This question, how accurate do these numbers actually be when you take into account the CPU cost? Um, these numbers are, are OK, right? The Where you have problems are are. How, are you going to like these formulas are okay, right? Um, it's it's these ones are going to be the problem, the n plus n, because let's say again, say I'm doing a, a, a three table join in my query. How do I? How can I predict? Uh, I'm going to have trouble predicting what's the number of tuples going to come out of the first join, and then feed into the second join. So that means my m or, or m is going to and m n or n is going to be off. That's just for two joins. What if I have a, a thousand joins? Which some queries actually do. They're not, you know, they're not, they're not super common, but they do exist. But now you're basically building like crappy statistics off of crappy statistics off of crappy statistics, and the numbers get way off. Yeah. 
And then we'll see this again after the midterm, but the, the one thing is that all, almost all the data systems are going to uh, underestimate how many tuples are going to come out from a, from a joint operator because they're going to make a bunch of assumptions about predicates like, like they're going to be non-correlated, even though they will be correlated. So the, the, the calculations, the estimates get way, way off. Yes? Just to clarify about the sort one, it has to be not just sorted, but also like clustered, right? So if, if we're just using a B tree on the main index of, of, of a table, it's still sorted, but there's going to be a lot of thrashing going through it in a sorted order. So the question is, uh, for, for the index and loop join, uh, that it's not enough to say that the... Oh, uh, I was talking about the... It's talking about the sort merge join? Yeah. Your, your, your question is about things thrashing? For the sorting, or what? In the sorted merge join, you said that if we already have something sorted, we don't have to resort, right? Yes. But like the index of the table is already sorted, but we can't use that. So, 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 so data can be sorted without an index, right? Yeah. So, like, so when we talk about these parquet files, where like uh, there's these open source file formats, like I, I could have my front end application make me a bunch of files from the from the front end database, and then it becomes basically immutable. But I can sort them as I store it. And then I don't have an index for how it's sorted. Just I did external merge sort and wrote it out. So, if you, so it doesn't always have to have an index to be sorted. So then your other point was, if you did have an index, though, is it the case that the, the could you still have thrashing? Because now as you're, because uh, you're doing random probes into the index? Well, no, because if, if it's clustered on the, if the data is clustered, you don't need the, to the probe of the index. You just walk through. You need an iterator, to, or some, your cursor to be able to walk through the pages in, in sorted order, but you don't need to refer to the index for that. Yeah, the, the, like, if things are sorted ahead of time, it, it, it alleviates a bunch of these things, uh, but most data is it's not going to be sorted. And again, like, a, a B plus tree will be log n, a hash table could be a 1. And so, you're, you know, the probe doing to do hash joining, it's still potentially much faster than doing a probe into a B plus tree. So then you say, okay, what if I have a hash table and I want to do an index and next loop join? Is that the equivalent as basically a hash join? Sort of, yes, but the, uh, again, you, you lose the flexibility of being able to do that recursive partitioning thing we talked about before. So I don't think, I, 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 we, take, we can go check, but I, th I think if you have a hash index, uh, and you do a join, Postgres won't try to pick it up to do an index and this loop join. But I'm not sure about that. Okay. All right. So hashing is, as I said, it's always going to be better than the than sorting. Uh, and basically, as I said before, there may be cases where things are already sorted ahead of time, or uh, you need the results to be sorted. The, the sort merge join algorithm actually might, might be better. But again, the, the good data systems that, that can support these different operators, they'll make decision on the fly for you which one actually you should be using. Okay? All right. Next class, midterm exam. <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> These databases, right? It's good stuff. Uh, okay, yeah, next class, midterm exam. Uh, any questions, email me or uh, post on Piazza. And then I said, I have, I have additional office hours tomorrow at 1 p.m. in my office uh, if you want to sort of check anything at the, right before the exam, okay? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip-hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Feel a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Records still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives.